7.5 quake casualties yet to be confirmed. As authorities move to assess extent of damage, and Red Cross donates to promote human rights. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for Monday's news. Our top stories on the earthquake a little later on. But first, the Medang MP says drug shortages in the country have become a serious concern given that the government is struggling to fund essential services like medicine. He adds, yet the government is spending 600 million kina on APEC alone. He says most of the people in the rural areas are dying of the lack of basic medicine. Our community. The, six clans, uh, the member for Medang says Kosia, most of the funds that were spent in Port Mosby should be committed to provincial hospitals. This is to ensure that basic services like medicine actually reach the people. It's a serious concern. The fact that um, the government is struggling to fund um, in terms of you know, essential services like medicine. And yet we're spending 600 million on APEC. What is APEC? Our people in the village are dying in remote locations and settlements for lack of basic medicine. And yet we're spending money that should have been going down to them. It's going into major events like APEC and building massive uh, multi-million kina uh, stadiums in Port Moresby. All their roads, double ceiling roads, roads that go nowhere. All the people's money is being spent in Port Moresby when that fund should be committed to the provincial hospitals and in terms of ensuring basic services. And that, this is what happens when you have bad governance. And corruption is rampant. I said a road in, in Port Moresby was a Prima six. says in his district, due to the limited budget, he, has, he won't be able to expand the budget to assist the Medang General Hospital. However, he has had talks with the hospital CEO to inform him of any issues affecting the hospital. The Medang Provincial Hospital, and I've expressed to them if they have any concerns on either supply of medicine or, pro, or issues at the Department of Health, they, they, they're free to make it known, known to me. And then I'll travel to Port Mosby, sit down with the health minister, sit down with the health department and get to the bottom of the issue. Last month, patients travelling from the remote villages like Usinobundi expressed frustration over the shortage of drug supplies in the province. Patients were given prescription to purchase drugs from pharmacies. Most of these patients say they were not able to afford drugs sold in pharmacies. MTV Medeng has been following up on the recent drug shortage experience at the rural clinics and the Modulon General Hospital. However, we were informed the health department had issued a secular advising them not to talk to the media. Does our attempts to talk to the hospital CEO or the director of medical services to find out why we have a drug shortage were not successful. Meanwhile, Mr. Kramer says the only issue that would be a problem is if any press release or statements issued by hospitals are misleading or are not true. But it is against the hospital's constitutional rights not to express their concerns to the media. If hospitals are issuing the truth and stating the truth, and it's a fact, I mean, you look at UPNG now, they've increased the fees. Why? Because the government never honors its commitment to fund the universities. So the universities have no money. So they've got no choice but to apply the fees, a fee structure times three. So if the government had it's, uh, it actually funded the universities how it's supposed to fund, then the universities wouldn't go and pass the burden of costs onto the students. And the same is now helping, happening in the health system because the government is failing again to fund the hospitals they, therefore, they're running out of medicine, and they're now putting the burden back onto their patients. And this is just a simple case of poor management, poor by the government issue of rampant corruption, and that's why the people now are suffering. Martha Luis, National MTV News, Medang. The four men who were arrested for assaulting a journalist in Leh were fined by the Leh District Court and released today. The fine, however, was offset by the 300 kina the four men were bailed out on two weeks ago as per decision made by the magistrate. The Moriba Governor's Project Officer, Stephen Botting, and five others assaulted post-Korea journalists in Leh, saying there were too many negative reports about the Moriba Governor, Ginsen Sauno, on mainstream media. Four of those men were arrested and charged. Magistrate Tara Dawai set a fine of 300 kina for each of the men involved in the assault. He said failure to pay the fine would result in three months imprisonment. However, 
He made the decision to settle the court fine with the 300 kina bail money that the four men paid, stating that the bail money would be converted into the court fine. Three weeks ago, Morbe Governor's Project Officer Stephen Botting and five others assaulted post Korea journalist Frankie Kapin over media reports they said were negative against the governor Ginsen Saonu. Mr. Botting also made threats against certain members of the lay media. A formal complaint was laid and the men were arrested and charged for assault and drunk and disorderly behavior. Since the incident, several organizations, both national and international, have released press statements condemning the actions of the governor's men. Former Morwe governors Kelly Naru and Luther Wenge also raised their concerns over this issue. I condemn in the strongest possible terms the actions from the offices of the current governor of Morobe. For the actions that they did uh, to the media is totally inglorious. It's uncalled for in inglorious. The Morobe governor Ginsen Saono has still not made any statements regarding the incident since it happened two weeks ago. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lee. The Mount Hagen police station cell block is one of the cleanest in Papua New Guinea. The International Committee of the Red Cross is working closely with Mount Hagen police to ensure the cell block is conducive for detainees. The ICRC has also donated some materials for the Mount Hagen cell block. ICRC continues to support Mount Hagen police station cell block. ICRC rep Gerard Mason says Red Cross will continue to work with Mount Hagen police to improve the cell condition. They presented materials such as wheelbarrow, gardening tools and buckets to the acting provincial police commander Jacob Kamiak on Friday. Today we bring uh, uh, materials that will help to maintain uh, material conditions uh, in a good state so the people, uh, the detainees, they, they, they can stay here uh, in good conditions. Red Cross started donating materials to the cell block since 2015. With their help, the acting PPC Kamiak, who was the former police station commander, renovated the cell block. Iron sheets were removed and replaced with iron bars for ventilation purpose. The cell has access to a clean water system and an improved hygiene system since 2015. The cell block no longer experiences breakouts because iron bars were built all around the cell. Bars inside, all around the cells. And, it, uh, and now it's secured. Uh, so it's, I really thank the Red Cross for the assistance they give us. Mount Hagen police station cell block, like other cell blocks in the country, was built in the colonial times. It was built to cater for less than 50 detainees while awaiting their court cases. However, the number of detainees has doubled over time due to the increase in the population of the city. Acting PPC Kamiak said they are making sure all the detainees are secured and LT to attend court cases before being released or transferred out. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. The APEC Business Mobility Group is now looking at modifying a system that will assist business travelers and make their travel more efficient within the Asia-Pacific region. Assistant Director of North Asia, Kimberly Stamatis, explained that the meeting is all about facilitating improvement to the APEC Business Travel Card for valid low-risk business travelers. By revising the operating framework, it will provide a foundation for which the Business Mobility Group and the APEC Business Travel Card can operate. In turn, the program can be strengthened and provide more integrity to legitimize the schemes, which then promotes the program within the whole APEC region. Here with Monday's news, we'll have more after these messages. Don't go away. Welcome back to the news. A senior officer from the Morbe Provincial Education Division said all schools are supposed to fill in two copies of the National School Census form and submit two to the Division of Education. The head teachers should fill in the student enrollment, classes and graduates under Section 3 correctly and submit them on March each year. The officer said schools have missed out on TFF funding due to not filling the forms properly and not submitting them on time. 
This is the National School Census for Elementary and Primary Schools from the Department of Education. Two of these forms has to be filled in by the school head teacher and must be submitted to the Provincial Division of Education by March each year. The division keeps a copy and sends the other copy to the Education Department. The information on this table must correspond to this in order for the schools to receive their TFF payments. In 2015 and 16, I think the school didn't receive their tuition free fee because of the census form that the teacher didn't fill in. Uh, last year, 2017, we received our tuition free fee because of the census form that we filled. And uh, we expect 250,000 because of the number of uh, population that we have, but we receive only 60,000. We have visited six primary schools a secondary school and an elementary school in Lay District who are yet to receive their outstanding in TFF payments of more than 3.7 million kina. St. Mary's Catholic Primary School has followed the steps in filling up the census form but has not received their outstanding since 2016. But if we have the money, if our country can have the money, uh, in reality they can put the money where their mouth is. So we can achieve some of the, the policies and the goal of the government. A senior officer from Morabis Provincial Education Division said the submission of the census form each year will determine the TFF payments for the next year. The officer said the form submitted must be filled in correctly. The officer said head teachers and principals must plan properly and use their funds wisely. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. The increasing demand for fuel within Port Mosby has meant that there are now more opportunities for SMEs to venture into fuel retail. For one such SME, today marked the beginning of the journey into the fuel business. Nine Mile Metro service station was officially opened by Housing Minister and member for Mosby Northeast, John Kaupa. Housing Minister John Kaupa was present at the opening today and offered his support for SMEs in this electorate. According to Minister Kaupa, his electorate stands ready to partner with SMEs as well as large investors in providing services to the people of Mosby North East. Any business development coming to my area, it's the responsibility of the member to join in hands and in partnership with a developer. Even if it's a local developer or international developer or anybody, we must participate so that they also contributed to the development of my electorate. The Nine Mile Metro is the first owner-owned, owner-operated Puma outlet in the Mosby Northeast electorate. According to Puma General Manager External Relations, Hulala Tokome, the opening of Nine Mile Metro was a demonstration of Puma's commitment to developing SMEs within the fuel retail space. Puma's commitment to, to PNG is a testament to what you see here today in terms of being able to work with the local SMEs and being able to encourage local SMEs to being in partnership, partnership, especially in terms of being able to open up such a site which is um, a deal-around, deal-operated site. We can only do so much with Puma, but at the end of the day, Mr. Manda, it's through your hard work as well, and it's through your commitment that you've been able to make this service station a reality in terms of having its opening today. For owner Manda Kungu, his journey from construction to now fuel retail has not been easy. He had invested about 1.2 million kina to develop this facility at Nine Mile. He is adamant that he can capitalize on this new venture, given that he owns a substantial amount of land which provides opportunity to expand. Most of my customers will be from, from uh, Kerama and the Ayrton Highways. It's now all by heavy trucks now, uh, truck now, all this now. And all by major customers, and then all some of our corporate clients, we look long with them. Uh, all uh, even all, all departments now, and then we look long with So CIS now, police now, all me look long, look long end. PDL3 landowners in the Gobe oil fields want to know why the Petroleum and Energy Department is delaying their rightful benefits. Clan leader Wilfred Upeke told MTV News all necessary documents have been presented to relevant agencies, but it has been nearly two years now that they have been waiting for their payments. He says since 2016, MRDC and DPE have not produced a financial statement for the Gobe trustee account. 
Members of the Wallotu clan have been waiting for the payment since 2016. They have gone through several court battles to present the case as the principal and owners of PDL3. Leader Wilfred Upeka says a ministerial determination has declared and given the rightful title for them to receive the benefit payment. The government of the day, the legal system of the country have declared and stated that that title is indivisible. It supersedes everything. It was around the same time last year when the Wolotu clan talked to MTV regarding the title to the customary land. They say services in the area remain in poor state while oil is being taken out from the land. We have not struggled yet. Come, come, now, enough now. All this labu number te mea, sambla dae na. All legally line stab logo ne, all tas, all all stab. Plenty, all die finish. Rex Caro is from the Olomoloko clan in the PDL4 area. He says boundaries with the Wolotus. Mr. Caro says all entitled documents have been the evidence to authorities. However, DPE remains quiet in processing the payment. Come, come, this process and we can finish straight law. Where uh, land style commissioner and uh, state solicitor general and uh, uh, petroleum department, all this land, yeah, 25 more, this land, something, M. Camarlo public straight, me up, me play on much of this land. According to the landowners, MRDC has requested for a court order before the payment can be processed. The Wallotu clan is unsure about that. MRDC am waiting one or something. DPM waiting who said. It's not a land on a day or. Or they became not a land on again or. That me foul. One or something I'm talking about. Make it seem like me can put on the table block again. Can you pay me? The state solicitor's office has given directions in a document to release the benefits for the PDL3 land owners. However, it has taken nearly two years to see that benefit. Well, we asked the Prime Minister of the day, MRDC board, please hear our cry, help us, and direct the management to pay our monies as soon as possible. The last two weeks has also seen other landowners in Gobe demanding answers from DP officers over benefits. Jack Lepave, Jr. National MTV News. To our top story now, and four children are confirmed dead while many remain unknown following the earthquake that struck Hela and Southern Highlands early this morning. National Disaster Office Coordinator Martin Mosse says the damage done is massive and reports are sketchy. Communication into the affected areas has also been cut off. Speaking this afternoon in Port Mosby, Mr. Mosse says the magnitude of such earthquake has never been experienced in the Highlands region. At the moment, the National Disaster Office has no confirmed reports of the scale of damage and its casualties. The depth of it, it's, you know, the, the, the strength of the, of, of, the, uh, of the earthquake has been felt very strongly out there. So we would have expected widespread damage. Uh, there have been unconfirmed reports coming through of number of deaths so far. Um, we cannot really disclose the number right now until we, uh, we, we are able to pro properly verify that. And of course, the widespread damage. I know, to, to, to hospital facilities, infrastructure like the roads, um, Highlands Highways, we are important for the economy of this country as well. Hela and Southern Highlands are the most affected as the 7.5 magnitude struck in the early hours of this morning. Sources in Mendy have confirmed with MTV News that four children are among the casualties. Vice Minister for Intergovernment Relations says authorities will work together to pool resources and help those affected. We have, I have advised some of the officers on the ground to go on the ground and assist the casualties, what the damage is, uh, how many lives are lost and how houses and properties are de uh, destroyed. So at the moment, uh, we don't have confirmed report. That, that's, that's what I should say. Mm -hmm. The effects of the earthquake were also felt in Anger, Western Islands and Western Province. Pictures sent in shows landslips blocking a main road in Tabubil. Calls have been made for the government to release funding to help those affected. I uh, would like to appeal to uh, 
the treasurer and to the national government uh, uh, to uh, release our funds, uh, issue the warrants uh, so that we can get our people mobilized on the ground and moving to do the assessments ourselves. Flights into Tari have also been suspended indefinitely. I think you can go now, look, look, now sit down, now come back and buy me. The National Disaster Office says a full report of the scale of damage done is expected to be released by tomorrow. Jack Lapave, Jr., National MTV News. No major casualties have been reported in oil and gas project sites this morning following the 7.5 magnitude earthquake. ExxonMobil and Oil Search, who have operations in neighboring southern highlands and Hela provinces, confirmed temporary halts to their operations this morning. ExxonMobil PNG, in a brief note, confirmed no casualties at its operations in Hyde's Hela province. As a precaution, it has shut its Hyde's gas conditioning plant to assess any damages to its facilities. Oil Search's production operations have also been shut down as a precaution, with the company also monitoring local communities to see how they can assist affected communities. Meanwhile, all flights into Tari Airport have been suspended upon direction from the National Airports Corporation. In a notice to airmen this morning, NAC, through PNG Air Services Limited, announced the closure of the Tari Airport until Friday this week to allow for assessment to be made on the aerodrome facilities. In light of this notice, Air New Guinea and its subsidiary, Link PNG, have suspended their flights into Tari. Flights into Mendi, Southern Highlands Province, have not been affected. The national government has dispatched disaster assessment teams to parts of southern highlands and Hela provinces following the earthquake early this morning. Chief Secretary to Government Isaac Lupari says the National Disaster Centre is working with provincial authorities to assess damages and impacts on service delivery. The Papua New Guinea Defence Force has also been mobilised to assist with the assessment as well as the restoration of services and infrastructure. People have been warned of the dangers of earthquake aftershocks and to take precaution when moving around. Following this morning's earthquake, a landslip has blocked off the Oktedi Mine Access Road in Western Province. Late this afternoon, OTML confirmed the landslip, which occurred along the section of the Tabubil Mine Road. Employees who worked the night shift at the mine and mill have been relocated safely back to Tabubil by helicopter, with all employees accounted for. The landslip damaged the water and concentrate pipelines at the slip location. Maintenance work on the damaged pipes will begin as soon as road access is restored and spare pipes are transported to the location. Managing Director and CEO Peter Graham said no damages have been reported at the mill and mine or in the Tabubil Township. However, the nearby Bolton village has lost power and options for restoring power to the village are being evaluated. Early estimates are that it will take at least several days to clear the road to allow for normal traffic flow. Clearance will commence traffic uh, will commence Tuesday morning under strict safety provisions. In the meantime, a skeleton crew will maintain inspections at the mill and mine. The highway between Tabubil and Kyunga has also suffered from a number of smaller landslips and cracks, limiting access to light vehicles only. PNG is now working on integrating digital preparations for natural disasters. Because the country experiences natural disasters, multi-hazard monitoring and warning systems best practice is a way forward to prepare for national disasters digitally. Ruel Yamuna, chair of the APEC Emergency Preparedness Working Group, said this will help in efficient data collection and processing. This leads to impact prevention and mitigation, which in turn contributes to better preparedness and risk expansion to improve warning through research and technology. You're with National MTV News. We'll have more after these messages. Don't go away. Welcome back to the news. A Saturday ceasefire vote at the United Nations appears to have changed nothing in Syria's brutal civil war. Activists say airstrikes and artillery are raining down still. Pro-government forces are mounting a ground offensive. Less than 400,000 people are estimated to still live in eastern Ghouta. Some of them are fighters, but others are just families, mothers, children, and they too live under this constant bombardment.
Images that the world has seen time and time again out of Syria. Another strike, another rescue of a bloody child whose name we may never know. Eastern Ruta has become a kill box. People here say they've never seen a week like this before. Activists have been trying to document what life, if one can call it that, is like for civilians here. In underground shelters, they hope they will survive. It's a miserable existence. There is no drinking water. We try our best to give children a little bit to drink. We eat once a day, or we don't eat at all. When the airstrikes stop, the brave and desperate venture out. We've come up waiting here for the food delivery. We have no food left, this boy says. We're waiting. If a round hits us, it's okay. We will die. Eight groups say hundreds have lost their lives this past week, thousands more wounded. A UN resolution calling for a 30-day ceasefire is nothing more than ink on paper, activists say. People fear the worst is yet to come, with reports of the regime and its allies launching a ground offensive. We want a ceasefire so that people can get out and breathe, so that they can treat their children. No matter what we say, no one can imagine what it's like being in this situation. And no one, it seems so far, can stop the horror for this population trapped in a living nightmare. Imagine signing up for a journey in which you are warned up front that you may be raped. That's what CNN reporter Anima Albagir faced in a follow-up to her undercover report on slave auctions in Libya. She went undercover to Nigeria to learn how people are smuggled through Libya trying to get to Europe. To prove just how brazen these criminals are, we're trying to see if someone will agree to traffic us to Europe. He calls himself Oveke one of an army of pushermen, the brokers who work alongside smugglers on the Nigerian end of the Africa to Europe migrant route. Taking me aside, Oveke repeats again, condoms, don't struggle if you're raped and ultimately, trust in God. From here begins the journey to Europe, the journey into the unknown. Many who undertake this journey are still unaccounted for. Now here's something for the mobile phone lovers. Samsung is fighting for dominance of the smartphone marketplace. The company hopes the newest Galaxy phone will give Apple's new iPhone X a run for its money. ...to take back its spot as the top smartphone maker in the world. When Apple launched the iPhone X, they took the number one spot. Samsung moved to number two. But now they're hoping with the enhanced cameras on the S9 and the S9 Plus that they'll be able to beat Apple. Plus, they're really separating themselves from Apple when it comes to the headphone jack. They're actually keeping a spot for that. Apple abandoned it. And with price, the new S9 will cost $720, much less than an iPhone. Any attention on a Samsung device rather than the family behind that company is welcome news for Samsung. The de facto leader of the company just got out of jail after spending less than a year there for corruption charges. This upset many anti-corruption campaigners in South Korea who thought thought that he might spend much closer to his full five-year sentence there. Here with Monday's news, we go for a break. When we come back, some sporting updates in Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. We begin with football and after the 11th hour appeal for funds to attend the OFC club championships, Medang FC finally got to play their first match in New Zealand. However, they lost to Fiji's Lautoka FC in their Group C match. Team Lautoka of Fiji up against. Visa issues meant Medang coach Mori Wasi was forced to play outfielder Vanya Malagan in goal and the standing performed well with some key early saves. He was eventually beaten in the 21st minute by Benji Totori, who extended his tally as the competition's all-time top scorer with his 23rd goal. Totori ten provider in the 32nd minute with fellow import Corey Chettleberg doubling Lautoka's advantage. Yes. 
Medan cut the deficit five minutes before halftime when Maskula and Pulung collected a spilled ball in Lautoka's goal to score. There's a goal for Medang. Vanuatu international Brian Kaltak restored the two-goal cushion for Lautoka with an excellent curling free kick in the 77th minute to round out a victory that could yet be a crucial step towards making the quarterfinals. Unfortunately, the other team had few players not coming, so we had a advantage over them, but uh, I think we need to improve a lot. Yes, I think they've got a lot of experience and um, they did combine well, but they also need to realize that they cannot be doing all the things. They need to release the ball on the sides and we need to talk to them about it. And so it will be good if they release a few times. Uh, I think Benji did not release. If we do that, then we, we can penetrate the defense more. Medang coach Moriwasi, who had just 12 players to call upon for the match, was proud of the energy and commitment levels of his players, but considered the result was fair. More about managing the team more than uh, anything, uh, so that we have enough players on the park to finish the game. But in saying that, there's no excuse. Uh, Lautoka were better on the day. They scored three goals, we scored one goal. And, you know, on that context, they deserve to win the game. Competition is getting better and better, so every team we play now has a big test. But uh, there's no, uh, there's a reason why Auckland City has been champions for a very long time. So it's it's going to be a mountain for us to climb. But look, it's football, and we're just going to take one game at a time, and hopefully uh, uh, we we put up a good performance. Group C's next matches in Auckland on Wednesday see AS Venice playing Lautoka FC and Auckland seeing on Medang FC. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. The Rugby League president of the Nandi Aviators Rugby League Association, Joe Gray, who was in the country for the match against Lace Next Tigers, said Rugby League over the past 10 years has transitioned and developed rapidly within the region. He says while his Pacific brothers continue to make strides on the international scene, it is up to the government to step in and help players develop their skills. Gray believes it all starts with discipline and a guided path for players. The Pacific Island. Joe Gray says following the success of Fiji and Papua New Guinea in the Rugby League World Cup competition, both Melanesian brothers have raised the level of their game. I must say, following and just reading through the transition and development that has taken place from 10 years ago to now, the Melanesian uh, brothers have now become a threat and uh, a team to reckon with. Gone are the days where they're only taken for formality. We can see the uh, development, the progress and the success story on the results of the World Cup. Yes, they may have not reached the finals, but however, for a team and within the island countries that don't really have the full expertise and know-how of this game and if these two teams can be reaching the semi-finals and quarter-finals that's an achievement but he questioned how the development of rugby can bring out the rising stars of the next generation of rugby league players in melanesia with finance there could be gymnasiums there could be expertise that could be uh, paid even with uh, the boys welfare clothing bus fares, uh, allowances, most of them would actually sacrifice and give up everything to concentrate on sports as their means of employment. And one is finance. He says developing young rugby players in Melanesia can be one aspect, but having the support and funds to create future rugby legends can be quite challenging. Most of our prizing stars, especially young stars, hit fame at the age of 17, 18, by 20 they've lost the plot. Arrogance, pride, which comes before the fall. And for me, I've always seen that as poor guidance, lack of nurturing and also commitment from senior executives and mentors. When asked about having a Pacific team in the NRL, here's what he had to say. Pacific Island team would be excellent for starters in the sense that I know that they could actually uh, form a collaboration to showcase the talents in the Pacific. But for me personally, I'd really like to see the Pacific Islands being represented on their own because they have their individual and their own flavors and their own styles of handling their rugby. So are the Samoans, Tongans and the Fijians. And with these forces, they actually would add value. They could actually inject more fear of 
greater competition and actually take rugby league up to another level because they're natural. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. We go for a break and when we come back some more sporting action in Trukai Sports. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. It's been a bittersweet farewell to the 2018 Winter Games where over two weeks more than 3,000 athletes from 92 countries competed for 102 gold medals. Sport and diplomacy went hand in hand to try to help relations between North and South Korea. Here is CNN's favorite moments from these games. Well, you know, I was at figure skating most of the Olympics and I saw so much falling and thrills and spills from the Americans that I just had to go to the women's ice hockey gold medal game. That was U.S. and Canada, of course, one of the great rivalries in sport, not just the Olympics, but, but of all of sport. And the U.S. hadn't won a gold medal in 20 years. The Canadians kept winning time after time after time. And wouldn't you know, the game lived up to its hype, lived up to its building. It's that great moment in sports when you expect it's going to be great and it's even better than you hope. And that, that game, of course, went to overtime, then went to the shootout. You had to have another shootout because they were so closely uh, uh, matched. And the U.S. pulls it off, that dramatic goal, the dramatic save by Matty Rooney. Uh, it was just, uh, I thought, one of the great moments of these games. For me, it was the best moment of these games. And when you think about it, it occurred exactly on the 38th anniversary of the Miracle on Ice, the greatest moment in U.S. men's hockey. So you've got the greatest moment in U.S. women's hockey occurring 38 years to the day after the finest, most historic moment in men's hockey and one of course the great moments in sports, that miracle on ice. To be there when the first unified Korea hockey team took to the ice, I remember looking at Christine and saying this is history. It really was uh, incredible, the atmosphere in the build-up. We had the families turning up with their children, carrying the two flags, having all those photographs on the steps with not only the South Korean flag, but also the unified flag. It's not every day you have a, an early round women's ice hockey match at the Olympics and you have a top level presidential delegation, not only from South Korea, but also the North as well. And, and then there were the cheerleaders. It was really our first experience of that North Korean cheer squad, which are unlike anything I've ever seen at any sporting event before and probably will do ever again. And you've got a real sense talking not only to the players that we've spoken to while we've been here and also to their families that while they haven't necessarily agreed with the political implications of, of what has happened, they have understood the bigger picture of what has been playing out here at the Olympics. And you wonder how we will reflect on it maybe five years, 20 years time. Uh, whether it is something that will just have had an impact here for one Olympic Games or how it will play into the much, much bigger political picture. At 17 years old, Chloe Kim becoming the youngest woman ever to win gold on snow in the Olympic Games. Her dad immigrated from South Korea with just $800 in his pocket, so you can imagine the feeling of her parents and for Chloe when she won gold in this country. I was right there with her parents when they celebrated their daughter's victory and I actually turned into a temporary bodyguard for Chloe's mom, escorting her all the way over to be there to see Chloe and I saw the first hug, hugging their daughter as an Olympic champion for the first time. The tears were flowing and I loved being right there to snap a picture of her father sipping a cold one after his daughter just won the gold one. Epic. Two skiing superstars going head to head for the first and last time at the Winter Olympics had the potential for blockbuster drama. In the end though, the wind picked up, which means that Michaela Schifrin didn't have the chance to go for five gold medals and we didn't have the chance to see these two compete against each other three times. In the end it was only once, but my goodness, it was dramatic. Lindsay Vonn missing out on a chance of going for another gold medal, saying this is her last Olympic Games. but. You never know with her, she is one of the fiercest competitors in sport. As for Michaela Schifrin, well, bitter, bitter disappointment for her. You know, I went up to her after she'd finished her last race and gave her a hug and I could just feel it and sense it. But you know, she's just 22 years of age. She's won two medals here. She's now got three in total. I think she'll be going for five again in Beijing. It's just that this time she probably won't say it out loud.
Not only did I get to see figure skating for the first time in person, I got to see what some are calling the greatest figure skater of all time, 23-year-old Yuzuru Hanyu from Japan. I have seen Tom Brady in person, I've seen LeBron James in person, and none of them receive the fan passion <laughs> and elation that Hanyu receives. People crying. It's like he's Justin Bieber or Michael Jackson out there performing, not just your ordinary athlete. And then to get all nearly trampled by people trying to throw Winnie the Poohs out onto the ice, I'll remember that forever. The thing I love most about the Olympics though, people from all over the planet, from different ethnicities and cultures and backgrounds coming together to do that which they love, breaking down barriers. It's the power of sport. Our world needs a lot more of that. And that story wraps up Trukai Sports for this evening. We'll go for a break. When we come back, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Trukai Sports. <laughs> True Kai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region. Port Mosby, Kerama, Alata and Popandata, a shower or two, a few showers expected in Daro. To the Mumasa region, a shower or two expected all across the region. To the New Guinea Islands region, fine weather expected all across the major centres in the NGI. And in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundia, Wapmendi and Wabeg, all these major centres to expect some brief showers with morning fog. were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's the way it is beginning another working week this Monday, the 26th of February 2018. On behalf of the MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night.